Buenas tardes. So I was born in, across the river, but I have been living all my life here in the United States. So I am a border native. Uh, this is our symbol for border native. It's a coyote uh, facing the moon, but with a mask, with one of those masks widely used during the Occupy Wall Street movement. We border natives appreciate the border region and because for us it's a unique place, a very important place. Uh, and for all of you who are not from the border, let me just very quickly tell you about three very important uh, uh, factors that makes this region special. One is that this uh, place was part of Mexico. More than 100 years ago, this was Mexican land, Mexican territory, part of the Republica de Mexico. So uh, that is very important to always remember. But there's also very important to remember that fact because there's another way to see immigration. When you see us crossing the border, just think that we are only coming back to our homeland. So another very important feature of uh, the border is that we have the largest concentration of Spanish-speaking people. By the way, uh, in the background is a photo and I realized that in the uh, beginning uh, slide of TEDx El Paso, you have a landscape of El Paso, of the city of El Paso, and in both this photo and that landscape, still you can see the city hall. The city hall no longer exists. And don't be optimistic. We do not get rid of the city government. We just demolish <laughs> the city building. <laughs> we are also a very poor city. We in the state are the second poorest city. And nationally, we are the third city. So here, also the border is the largest concentration of poor people. But we have a very expensive wall. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, federal government, $3.9 billion for each mile of wall. And soon, we're going to have a very expensive baseball stadium. We're going to have a very lousy baseball team, but we're going to have a very expensive baseball stadium. I don't know if this goes like this. Can you hear me? Uh, did I tell you that I was a political cartoonist? I had much fun when I was a political cartoonist because I, can, I was able to criticize bad governments, politicians, and exploitation of people. Unfortunately, political cartoonists don't have a future in this world because bad government, politicians, and exploiters don't have a sense of humor. So all political cartoonists advice is that they become a labor organizers. That's even better because you will be able to hit those people directly. So I became a farm labor organizer in 1983. In 1983, we founded here in El Paso Sin Fronteras Organizing Project uh, with the idea of pushing the workers, the farm workers, to fight the abuses, the exploitation, and to the struggle to improve their conditions. Uh, but in order to understand, you know, farm labor, you need to understand one of the most important elements in our lives. And I'm not talking about the smartphones. I'm talking about food. <laughs> food is very important. You can live without smartphones, but you cannot live with, without food. Food is the most important element in our life. And very, two very important features that I like to highlight 
is that food is what keeps us connected to nature, which is very important these days as we uh, get more and more concerned about climate change or the climate crisis. Food is very important for US economy. The food, fruit and vegetable production in, in America represent annually a value of $40 billion. So it's a very important sector of our economy. And yes, here in the border area, we have agricultural production. We grow everything, onion, lettuce, watermelons, and chili. Yes, lots of lots of chili. You know, especially in New Mexico, we grow lots of lots of chili. Chili in New Mexico in, in uh, last year was set more than 77,000 77, tons of chili. And the value was $64.4 million. Chili from New Mexico also brings uh, $400 million to the uh, economy of the state. These days, everybody loves chili. Used to be a Mexican thing, but now everybody eats chili. Too bad that we got late with this bucket, but we were hoping to be here on time during the lunch, because now, if you eat with a chili, you know, you are eating the incorrect way. <laughs> so chili was started, chili production in this area was started in 1906 by Fabian Garcia from Chihuahua. He started in New Mexico, in Las Cruces, he started to work, to do research to improve the chili. And, but that was the local, for local consumption. 100 years later, chili is the most important ingredient of the, Mexic of the US nutrition of everybody. More than ketchup. Ketchup used to be the most important. <laughs> So who harvests the chili? Uh, every night at midnight, the farm workers wake up and go outside to a place near the, uh, El Paso del Norte International Bridge uh, to look for work in the chili fields. They start leaving to the fields around 2 o'clock in the morning, and they will arrive to the fields at 5 o'clock. Sometimes they go as far as Lordsburg, New Mexico. As soon as it's clear enough to see, they start picking chili. This is actually a bucket of chili, of the famous hash chili. Though at the end of the TEDx El Paso, don't forget to take some of this chili with you. They pick chilies every day until they complete the amount requested by the food processing companies. For each bucket of this chili, they get a plastic ship like this. Each bucket, you get a plastic ship. And at the end of the day, you cash this plastic ship for money. Today, each plastic ship represents 65 cents. So imagine how many buckets you need to make in order to at least make the minimum wage. So, but Chile is, you know, very important for a region. It creates prosperity. The problem is that chili pickers don't enjoy of this prosperity. They have an, on average an income of $6,687 a year not even close to the federal poverty income guidelines. So they are the poorest of the poor. Talking about poor city, the farm workers, no matter how hard they work every day, no matter how early they have to wake up to be in the streets to look for work, they don't, they don't afford to either be, to even be an official poor. They are the poorest of the poor. The mechanization of agriculture has intensified oppression to the point that 72% now suffer unemployment. Uh, by the way, a third of the farm labor force in this area are women, single mothers, head of households. And women, female farm workers, get 
lowest wages and are the ones that hire the last. So low wages and, uh, and unemployment, no wonder 25% of them don't have a place to live. They have to rely on shelters in order to spend the night. 65% don't have a decent roof to live. Uh, but this is the nature of US agriculture, American agriculture. And this nature is not only affecting farm workers, but, it's, but this, the nature of agriculture is affecting all of us, especially with the use of these technologies. So what we have today is an agriculture system that you know is finding the ways to produce every time more and more and cheaper. But not cheaper so you can go to the market and find good prices. Cheaper so they can are able to compete in the global market and they are using new technologies. Uh, new technologies uh, like genetic modified foods because the only purpose of U.S. agriculture is to make profits. It's not their purpose to satisfy nutrition needs. They don't grow food thinking about us. They grow food thinking about the profits they can make. And, and in that drive for more profits, they now use you know, uh, technologies that are not only affecting uh, human beings, by nature. 34% of the greenhouse emissions today are caused by agriculture. And I'm talking about large-scale agriculture. I'm not referring to small farmers, to campesinos that continue to, to grow food in the traditional ways. We have a farm worker center where we are trying to fight against this model of agriculture that poses a danger to farm workers, but also to all of us. We have a farm worker center. It's not far from here, actually. Uh, if you go the Oregon Street South, at the end of the street, you will find the farm worker center. Here at the farm worker center, we uh, have been working for many years, uh, created an alternative, a new system, a new way of doing agriculture, of producing food that ends with the exploitation of workers and the exploitation of nature. This alternative is what we call the food sovereignty alternative. The food sovereignty is a concept that, that first was released by La Via Campesina in 1996. La Via Campesina is an international movement of peasants, women, indigenous people, fisher folks, rural workers, migrants, who have decided to create a new way of producing food, a new way of practicing agriculture, to benefit not corporations, but everybody. Food sovereignty means three rights. The first is the right of people to grow food. You have the right, you should have the right to grow food. Today, you don't have that right. If you want to buy a piece of land, to produce your own food, you will not be able to do it. Because the, the logic of the system today is only allow production for export, large scale production. You know, for these, the people in charge of the food system, having somebody to produce food for their own family is a nonsense. You should be producing for the big market. That's what uh, the system is telling everybody. So you should fee, have the right to produce your own food, to be campesina and campesino. You as a consumer should have the right to, to good food. And I'm not talking about, you know, about cheap food. I'm talking about the food that you need to satisfy your nutritional needs, to keep you healthy, to keep you happy. And not only that, but food according to your own culture, to your history, to your origins. You know, nobody should give you food that is not for you. And the third right is the right of everybody to have their own 
uh, food policies. Nobody should di dictate why somebody uh, that a nation has to, for example, eat junk food. You know, the example is Bolivia, that finally they got rid of McDonald's and some of those junk food. So everybody should have their own policy. So my proposal today is to build a food sovereignty now movement. A food sovereignty that brings a model of production and consumption that respects human dignity, that satisfies the nutritional needs of everybody, and that respects and strengthens our communities in nature. Uh, so I'm here to propose that we start actually a movement, a mass movement, with many actions, with a lot of us doing many things from growing food to starting consumer co-ops, production co-ops, family orchards. We need to occupy all those vacant land and convert it into farm production spaces. We need to become active. Uh, this is a movement to call that calls it, that calls everybody to go beyond washing fruits and vegetables to eat chemical free food. Everybody, all of us do that. All of us do wash our food to eat. But that's only an individualistic act of action. It's like praying for ourselves and forgiving about everybody else. We need to do something more than that. When we are eating chemical-free foods, we forgot, we forgive that somebody picked those foods in the field. We forgot that somebody, you know, took that food to the supermarket. There were many people before us. And by, you know, by making sure that we eat chemical-free food, we are doing nothing to resolve the problem, which is a society. oppression-free food is what we should strive for, to eat oppression-free food. No oppression to human beings, no oppression to nature, no oppression to nothing. Uh, if you want to join our movement, feel free to join us on Facebook, Sin Fronteras, Dark Centro. Muchas gracias.